Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Delighted to see a, a good turnout in, uh, this afternoon. Um, our guest this, op this afternoon for this session really needs this introduction, and one of our best known uh, <laughs> presenters in public life. Um, he's going to talk about his upbringing, his youth, and his book, his excellent book, The Gift of a Radio. And by way of introduction, I could do little more than simply to read the few sentences on the back. From an early age, Justin Webb knew that his upbringing was strange. There was the famous father he had never met and the stepfather he couldn't stand. The Quaker boarding school where bullying and drug taking were rife. And then most important of all, there was his mother, coping alone with her husband's mental illness and horrified by the prospect of social decline. And the backdrop to this family in crisis, Britain in the 70s. Led Zeppelin and free strikes inflation, and IRA bombings. With that, Justin, I'm astonished you're here. <laughs> <laughs> but this is a comedy. <laughs> will, you, will you please give a warm welcome to Justin <laughs> Thank Webb. You. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, uh, Justin, let's just start sort of more or less in the middle. How, how did this title of this book come about? Well, it came about because uh, back in the 70s, what my children called the black and white days, um, if you wanted to escape from difficult home circumstances, there were very few options. Um, people here are way too young, all of you, to remember the 70s, but, but um, either that or incredibly well preserved by the Isle of Wight air. But the 70s were a time where we were still way, way, way pre-internet. We didn't really watch the television much, particularly if you were in a middle-class household. You put the television in a corner of the room and you covered it with something or put a chair in front of it to show it who was boss. <laughs> and my mother very much believed in that. So to a child growing up, the TV wasn't on. There was no, no, um, there was no sort of instant thing to do except to switch on a radio. And when I was 11 years old, my mother gave me a radio and it allowed me to escape from what was actually, although I didn't really know it at the time, a pretty miserable and certainly eccentric childhood. So it was this idea of escape um, from the boredom, actually. Another thing that people in this room might remember being bored no, no young person does. My children said that my, I was trying to explain the notion of boredom to my youngest child, my 19-year-old the other day. She looked at me as I was completely mad. Um, <laughs> she literally couldn't understand the concept of it. Um, uh, and, and she also, interestingly, couldn't understand the concept of the, the 70s. I was, I was telling her about the depredations of, of daddy's youth, driving her home from school. This was actually a year or two ago. And, I said, you know, when Daddy was young, uh, we didn't even have a car. And she looked up from her book and said, oh, when were they invented? And I thought, <laughs> but, but that is the period that I'm writing about. It's a period that most people here will be vaguely familiar with, but actually a, an entire several generations genuinely isn't with any aspect of it. Justin, you had this confused, miserable childhood, to, to quote you. Um, the two central figures in it were your stepfather and your mother. Let's, let's start with your stepfather. You, you start by saying he was mentally ill. And indeed, yeah. one of your earliest memories is that you were, he went for a swim and you rather hoped he wouldn't come back. Yeah. yeah. Tell, yeah. It, tell us about your stepfather. Yeah, I mean, my stepfather, and I, I, it's one of the interesting things about writing a book about yourself. Um, is that you, people sometimes ask me whether it was cathartic. It didn't start out as an exercise in catharsis, but I did come to differing conclusions about the way everyone had behaved during the course of writing it. And it's another of those things that we've lost in the modern age, it seems to me. One of the reasons I wrote it is that now we're all, um, uh, everything's instant, including our judgments about each other. And we don't properly recognize that people during the course of their lives go through stages, make mistakes, change their minds. And this, in a sense, is a book about coping, changing. My mother, who we talk about in a bit, hugely, 
But me, as a child, I, I couldn't stand my stepfather. She, he had been sort of, uh, uh, um, he was desperately mentally ill. One, one of my, my, my mother's um, stories about him is going to the doctor a week after she married him, and they shared a GP already, and she said to the GP, I'm really worried about Charles because he's been pouring uh, the milk down the sink in the early morning. I come downstairs, this man I've newly married, um, and he's pouring the milk down the sink, and I don't know what to do. And the GP, and this again is the, is the 60s and 70s bedside manner, the GP turned to my mother and said, I'm sorry to tell you, Mr. Webb, Miss, Mrs. Webb, that your husband is stark staring mad. <laughs> which was a diagnosis uh, in, 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 in those days. And of course, we, we treated mental illness with a sort of mixture of, of fear, but also of humor, actually. We thought it was a joke, and we were also terrified, and both were wrong. And it seems to me one of the things we do do better now, there are lots of things I don't think we do do better, but this is one of them, is we, we understand proper mental illness. I'm not talking about minor league depression. My, my stepfather was... Uh, probably schizophrenic, but certainly was was desperately um, unhappy. Saw um, saw things that weren't there. Heard voices. His whole life, and it was something that was brushed under the carpet. Um, as a family, we never talked about. The neighbours obviously knew that he was peculiar, but nothing more than that. I write about him in the book buying padlocks for our garage door endlessly because he thought people were coming into the garage and slightly moving the window of the car in order to show him who was boss. And that kind of that sense of oppression, um, uh, he constantly felt through his life. So the, 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 uh, what, what I, the, the change that I come to in the book is that I realize actually that we all treated him badly. The authorities, my mother actually, who rather othered him, who always used to say, she used to love the story of me asking when I was young, um, where did we get Charles? Uh, she thought it was a hoot, and because of the implication being she should go back to a pub and find a better model of, of, of man, um, which I think she also thought she probably ought to have, have, have done, though she decided in the end not, not to act on it. But that kind of sense of him being a separate person, um, and, and I, I, again, I write in the book about his... his uh, suicide attempt, or the one that I knew about, which was on, I can't remember how old I was, but it was a young birthday, and I was allowed on my birthday by my mother to have a bowl of Frosties. I don't know if Frosties still exist, but it's sort of sugar-coated stuff. Uh, my mother thought, e even in the 70s, my mother was vaguely aware of health food, uh, as it was then called, and thought that Frosties weren't a good thing. So I was only allowed it once on my birthday, and my Stepfather tried to kill himself upstairs. We lived in this tiny little house, and the ambulance men came, and I had to be moved out of the kitchen so that they could get the stretcher around. And I, 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 afterwards, my main concern was that my Frosties had become limp. <laughs> uh, and I, I, you, know, you realize, as an adult looking back, that that isn't right, that there's something going deeply wrong there. But we regarded him as a completely separate entity outside the family, and that was wrong to do. And I don't know, as I, I think I do address this in the, in the book, the question of when you as an individual become responsible for the things that you do and say. And I, I treated him poorly. I just didn't want anything to do with him when I was a child and when I was a young adult too. He died when I was at university, so early 20s, which I think is a pity. So anyway, a miserable life and a, and a life that was very much an exemplar of how those people, people who were severely mentally ill, were treated until really quite recently. He had, to, I mean, you're portraying a, what, a fairly strange sort of setup. Uh, what was his relationship with your mother? Did he provide her with the sort of prosperity and stability that you'd expect her husband to do? I think, uh, Richard, if my mother heard you using the term relationship, she would have <laughs> raised her <laughs> eyes to the skies because we didn't talk about relationships really and I don't think she would have said that she had one. Most peculiar, an early forerunner actually of modern internet dating, my mother in desperate circumstances uh, finds herself pregnant for reasons we'll get to perhaps in a, in a, in a bit uh, and without a husband in the year 1961 and that's a desperate situation and with no money uh, and her job 
um, is suddenly taken away with her because, from her because they say we can't have a, an unmarried woman who's pregnant in the office. Uh, 1961. And um, she uh, decides to keep the baby, uh, which is a relief to me. Uh, <laughs> and, and, um, uh, and answers an advertisement in the New Statesman, actually, who's, who's uh, chief <laughs> editor was here. I should have mentioned her. That would have thrown him off his, uh, his face. <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, she answers an advertisement in the New Statesman uh, for a housekeeper and uh, for the village postmaster in Bruton. And Bruton in those days, you've probably all got second homes in Bruton and where you, you keep quinoa there and all the rest of it. Bruton in those days was a pretty basic Somerset village. And uh, my stepfather was the postmaster. What she didn't know is that he'd been fired from the Bank of England because he'd become, he was a clerk in the Bank of England. He'd become deranged and they'd sent him to Bruton, which is what you did with deranged people. Days. <laughs> Who knows, possibly you still do. So she'd answered this advertisement, uh, had gone to be his housekeeper, they had got married only mm. a few months, I think, after. So, so, so the relationship, to go to that word, uh, was pretty much zero. She yeah. knew absolutely nothing about it. But what she needed, of course, is a, 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 someone to look after her, a man. Because you needed a man in those days, because without a man, you were pretty stuck. Um, and, and that was what she got in, in him. She got an awful lot more in the way of baggage as well, but she got the man. I don't, don't know if uh, race is the right word, but she seems to have had a fairly yeah. racy life. Yeah, and you said of, of boys, yeah. men, and drink. Yeah. Uh, this is before, before yeah. we, after around the time yeah. of her first marriage. She'd been married before and then marries again. Mm. How did you discover who your real father was? Mm. I was watching uh, children's television, probably Blue Peter, and the program finished, and we were about to put the television back away and have uh, supper, and the news came on, and my mother looked at it for a minute or two and said to me, that man there is your father. <laughs> And then she went next door behind the hatch. All these old, did you remember hatches? I mean, yeah. we always had hatches. Well, they were a thing, weren't they? And even in quite tiny little houses like ours. Then she went behind the hatch, I remember, to go and prepare sausages, tea. And I was left looking at Peter Woods, who was a lugubrious looking fellow. Um, I, I, I find now in the early morning, in particular, when I get out to dinner, I, I do. <laughs> I do recognize him in, in the mirror, but in those days, he didn't look anything particularly like me. And I thought, oh, that's very strange. But, but something, I mean, here, people, again, you will, people will understand this in a way that a younger generation won't. I knew, I knew that my mother didn't want to say another word about it. There was no need for her to say to me, we don't speak about that. I just knew it. I picked it up. It was there in the ether. Um, for even a small child to understand. Is that why you had no contact with him? Absolutely no contact with him because I knew that my mother would be distressed by it. And for me, the main uh, thing for my life, actually for selfish reasons as much as, as not, were, was I wanted to keep the show on the road, as it were. I wanted to keep her happy. Um, and I spent a lot of my young life um, as you do when you're the son of a mother and you have this incredibly close relationship, effectively a single parent relationship, you want to keep her happy. And it, it is a close relationship and in many respects a, a wonderful relationship, but it has this oddly cloying thing about it. And I knew that if I'd tried to contact him, it would have made her unhappy. So I, I, I suppressed it or repressed it or whatever. It ends in press, but I can't remember which the right, right term is. But I, I, it, it was not part of my life at all, a genuinely not part of my life. I didn't think about it. But looking back and writing this and thinking about my life, of course, it was there from that moment in front of the evening news uh, onwards. So then she has you um, two years before she remarried. And then she marries an accountant who was stark staring mad, mm. yet she was concerned about her social standing. Mm. You cover this quite a lot in the book about, <laughs> about the fact that yeah. she leaned left even though she considered herself middle class. Yes, my mother was a left-wing snob. Uh, her her favourite people in the 1970s, and I'm aware that there are some extremely distinguished politicians here, uh, both on the stage and off it, uh, from those from that 
period. My mother's favorite politician was Tony Benn uh, 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 because he spoke properly. Because when, he, <laughs> because when he said, I don't see anything wrong with socialism, he spoke as a gentleman would speak. Uh, and he was, in fact, so posh that he'd actually given away a peerage. And my mother thoroughly approved of that. She did not approve of Lady Thatcher because she thought she'd had elocution lessons. And my mother saw social class as a kind of caste system. She didn't think that you could get from one class to another. Um, one of her favorite skits on the television was Peter Cook um, uh, sitting on a park bench where he's playing the part of a minor, and he says, I... I, w I would have been a high court judge, but I didn't have the Latin. I didn't have the Latin for the judging. And my mother didn't really get the joke. She's always entirely right that he should not be a judge because he hadn't studied Latin. Uh, and, and she had this sort of sense of the world that you could still have in the 1970s as being extraordinarily stratified. Um, so, you know, Edward Heath as well. Um, she couldn't stand because she thought he was lowly born. And, 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 and so all of her, and if you think of the left in those days, or well, Michael Foote, she thought was just wonderful, bookish and stylish and all the rest of it. Ben, she loved uh, a lot. Um, she loved Bruce Kent. I don't know if people yeah. remember Bruce Kent, for the, who was also an extraordinarily well-spoken uh, <laughs> member of the left. So all of that. There was a guy called Stuart Holland, which is, I'm becoming a little more arcane now, but I was the MP for... Vauxhall, I think, in London. Oh, again, a proper upper middle class stop, my mother thought, and jolly, jolly sensible man. So she had her politics was entirely kind of cut off from her attitude to her fellow man, which was very, very snobbish. Um, in later life, it went, it dissipated. And this, in a sense, coming back to what I was saying right at the beginning, this ability that we all have to change to soften, perhaps in some ways to harden our attitudes. But our attitudes, we are not who we are forever at any one stage in our lives. And my mother, as you say, I mean, you use exactly the right word, racy. She did have a, a, a racy start in life, a rather desperate start, because in the post-war years, frankly, there weren't a lot of good men still around. They were either dead or they were quite badly damaged by their experiences in, in, in the war. Um, and she uh, she suffered, I think, from that. But then, during the course of her life, this snobbism gradually, gradually reduced. Um, uh, so when I was young, I can remember a whole list of things that were just not acceptable. Um, it began weirdly with um, with begonias, uh, <laughs> perfectly innocent little plants, but my mother thought they were lower middle class. <laughs> uh, and it then extended to every word, I, I can never quite remember the full list, but every word that had ever been anglicized from the French. So perfume was scent, dear, scent, not perfume. Um, uh, uh, toilet, it, to this day, if I see in a BBC script the word toilet, I have to cross it out and, and, and write lavatory because I know that <laughs> my mother is sadly long, long departed, but I know that she's looking down on us. And I know actually the only thing she'll care about is that I don't say toilet on air. So I never will <laughs> for the entire career that I have at the, at the BBC. So those sorts of things she really, she really held to. But then in later life, she softened. She could see the funny side of it, actually. And she became a Quaker. She became a pacifist. I think she was the first Quaker Maoist. I used to tease her about this. Because she thought it would be very sensible if everyone just wore a uniform, dear. Um, uh, but at the same time, she had this real kind of sense of the importance of world peace. She, had a, she was a herself personally a pacifist. Um, she had a sort of range of views about individuals that was much more interesting because she, because she was always powered, I suppose. This is the thing. She was always powered. It wasn't a hyacinth bouquet sort of snobbism where there's a defensive mechanism, but she genuinely thought she was superior to, to, to everyone. Uh, she thought the queen was common. <laughs> uh, because the Queen had allowed the cameras into Buckingham Palace at the end of the 1960s. She thought, very vulgar, dear, very vulgar thing to do. So she had this sort of power that enabled her, and again, this is the story of, of, of a whole generation of, of people, and there may well be some here who, who feel this in their own lives. 
there was a downward mobility. We're always talking on the Today program about upward mobility, social mobility, and it's a good thing, and it is a good thing, but the, for people to be upwardly mobile, a few have got to be downwardly mobile as well, and my mother was properly downwardly socially mobile, and the thing that kept her and, and allowed her still to have that kind of sense of herself was this, this absolutely impregnable feeling that whatever happened to her, however poor she became, and she was quite poor um, by the end of, of her life, there wasn't a lot of money around, she still felt this, 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 this personal and class, um, if not superiority by the end of her life, then impregnability, and that, that never left her. And yet, I suspect her, before she became a Quaker, she introduced you to pop music and, and cannabis. Mm. I mean, yeah. uh, is this... Very keen that I took up cannabis smoking. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but, and you used to read out loud quite a lot with her, yes. and you developed this technique of reading aloud without any sign that you were reading. Yes. Was this a taste of things to come? Hugely, I think. I, I mean, it's interesting. You, you go... Because her her father was the first editor of the Radio Times, Leonard Crocombe. So there was on both sides of my family some sort of journalistic um, ability. Um, and certainly, actually, my father was an extremely able tabloid journalist before he joined the BBC. He worked for the Daily Mirror in the days when the Daily Mirror was a, a proper kind of journalistic force. He, he, he um, uh, parachuted into Suez. His first ever parachute drunk, jump was with British troops when they were landing in Suez. And he, he was a, a proper sort of daring do journalist um, uh, in, in those days on the, the Daily Mirror. So there is in my blood, as it were, to an extent, to the extent that these things are real, to the extent that we are um, genetically programmed by our parents, and I think that is to a limited extent, frankly. But anyway, it was, it was certainly there. But it was honed by my mother, who was really keen, along with the snobbism, she had a real eye for good writing. And she wanted, um, I can remember when I was young, at my, my prep school, her putting me in for the diary competition, the winter diary competition. And I said, well, what, I can't do that because we never do anything. And uh, which was true, we never really did do anything. We were stuck in this little house with my desperately ill stepfather and we didn't go out. And, and she said, don't worry about that, just write about um, write about things that don't happen. So I wrote this diary entry, which I think I write about in the book, where I said, you know, we we came home from a long walk and we our dog Fido got mud on the floor and we had to clean it off. No, we didn't, because actually we never go out and my dog Fido doesn't exist. He's only in my imagination. And I won the competition. I, <laughs> I still think to the enormous chagrin of the other parents who must be thinking, what on earth is this about? And of course, that early ability, not only to... Um, not only to write cogently, but also to make things up. It's hugely useful in the, in the world of journalism that I then found myself uh, in. So you, you got that kind of sense, that real sense from my mother of things that are spoken out loud, things that are written cleverly are good, and everything else. She couldn't give a damn about anything else um, uh, academically. She really cared about that. And I'm sure that when I used to read to her, when she was at her saddest, looking back on it, when I was young, um, and I remember she used to go to sleep while I, while I read to her, but I developed definitely a knack of reading and looking at the same time, and that, that um, served me well, as it, as, it, as, as it later turned out, I think, probably better than any other academic thing that happened, certainly that happened at my school. And then she sends you off to mm. Sukkot School, which was a Quaker school in, yes. in tune with her faith. Yes. You were, you're pretty scathing about it from the first sentence in the book. <laughs> you say a passing motorist would think it was a laundry or an open prison. Yeah. Uh, how, how did she choose this school for you? She chose it because the, she had joined the Quakers by then. The Quakers offered, she was the clerk of, of Bath Meeting, and anyone who is a Quaker will know that, that is a sort of position in... Uh, within Quakerism, and it allows you to, um, uh, to to be in charge of a local meeting. And they said to her, um, would you like to send your son, I think they felt sorry for me, actually, would you like to send your son with us paying to the local Quaker school? And it was the local Quaker school in Somerset, but it was far enough away. And she wanted me to be away from our house, which by then was quite dysfunctional, extremely dysfunctional. So she sent me, so that was the choice of school. That was as much choice as, as that went into it. 
Um, and th there was a, a, a sort of sense, I think, as well, of wanting me to be, to, to discover a world that was outside our own world, not just physically, but mentally as well, intellectually as well. In fact, of course, all boarding schools in the 1970s were pretty hellish. Uh, and mm. although it was a mixed school and a Quaker school, I mean, I, Woody Allen used to tell that joke about being so weedy he was beaten up by Quakers. Well, I was beaten up by Quakers. <laughs> um, it was a really, not, not from the staff, it wasn't like so many of these, these awful revelations that we see now about the damage done to, at, 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 um, at public schools. It, it wasn't, um, the, the masters didn't behave badly um, to the pupils, but the pupils actually behaved badly to each other. Uh, we bullied each other. It was Lord of the Flies. Um, we were allowed to get on with it, and we did. And I, I, I write in, in the book about just the way in which, and people here will remember this, we didn't, hadn't invented childhood properly in the 1970s. And we, you know, I, 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 when I went to, when I contacted the headmaster who had come to the school when I was in the sixth form and is still alive, Tom Leindorfer, and I got hold of him in Somerset and said, what are your memories of the school? And his first memory, arriving at the school to take over as headmaster, he said to one of the masters, where are those boys going? And the boys were dressed in uh, caving gear with the lights and all the, the kit. And the master said to him, they're going uh, caving. In the, the school was in, in near Cheddar Caves, but they just went off potholing. And Tom Leindorf said to the master, uh, is anyone going with them? Uh, wh wh how do we know where they are? And the master said, well, they, they are told that they must be back for tea. And that, <laughs> that was the entire safety. Can you imagine now? I mean, the BBC, we have to sign off documents before we kind of meet members of the audience. Literally, there's one document you sign, presence of members of the audience is a risk uh, that, that you have to... But in those days, we, we, just, we just sent people off. We sent kids off down caves, and we hoped that they were back for tea. In fact, we told them, you must be back for tea. I played rugby for the um, local village, Thirds, uh, um, uh, Winscombe Thirds. I remember playing Yatham Thirds, um, uh, who were a bunch of um, uh, farmhands and plasterers who lived in South Bristol, uh, often in their 30s and 40s, who just liked to come and beat up some local school children. And they'd beat you up. We would play it on a field that had been recently vacated by cows. And, 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 and then at half time, we'd all go off and they would drink beer out of a watering can. And I, I mean, the amount. You know, so in the second half, they're not only violent, but drunk as well. Mm -hmm. And this was considered character building. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the, so all those things didn't apply just to my school, but right across the board. We just didn't treat children in the way that we, we treat them now. And, and at the school in the 70s, there was that, this real sense of just being able to do your own thing. A lot of drug taking, um, a lot of drunkenness. And every man for himself or girl for themselves, although interestingly the girls, who I still know, I call them girls, they're in their 60s now, but uh, when I occasionally meet and have lunch with them, they say they knew nothing of this, and the girls actually treated themselves and were treated much better. So that is either just because females are better at these things, or, be or perhaps there was just a brutality of the times that men were expected to, to behave like that and did. You described the, the school as a place of despair mm. and um and you resorted to taking up cookery of all things yes that's <laughs> right well i was absolutely hopeless academically and i could see no point in it my mother was really my mother was not the slightest bit interested um in in academic endeavor um she thought if you held your knife and fork properly uh you will always do well uh, <laughs> And then she'd say, and in later life, when I used to say, you know, you need a bit more than that, she would say, well, look, dear, you've done perfectly well. And, you've, and I said, well, I did eventually get some exams. But in the early part of my schooling, I, I didn't. I gave up. In fact, I was forced to give up. I, I, this, so this school, so people sometimes write to me um, uh, those abusive uh, uh, emails and, and tweets that you get saying, you, you know, you are um, a posh, privileged, white, useless, over-promoted, or all that much of which is true, but the, the, it's the privileged bit, I always say. I, you, you, 
and it goes actually again to this business of, of, of trying to sum up people. We, we are so tempted in the modern age to look at someone, hear how they speak, and that's it. That's who they are to you, identity as, as, as they call it. And, and I was privileged in many ways. I had the enormous love of an amazing mother, um, which is the best privilege I think you can have in, in life. But in other ways, I wasn't privileged at all. And my school was absolutely hopeless. And, and I took not a single science um, for O-level. And I didn't have the excuse that the wonderful Lord Carrington used to give for not being educated in science. He said, oh, my dear, I was, I was educated before science was invented. <laughs> and I, and then, he could bring it off, but I, of course, couldn't. I mean, it, it was, science had been invented, but I knew nothing of it. And I was forced to give up, I think I write about this, but I was forced to give up biology O-level because I'd, I'd, again, this goes to my mother and this sort of writing thing. I'd, 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 I'd answered a question about the alimentary canal, and I had said, the alimentary canal went from London to Liverpool and, <laughs> and had recently been reopened by the London to Liverpool <laughs> Alimentary <laughs> Canal Society because if you remember, it was a big thing in the 70s. We were reopening all the canals. So I was, had to go and see the headmaster and was told I may not take biology. So I, I left school with not a single science qualification uh, at all um, uh, and, it, and, it, and, and utterly um, sort of un schooled in the idea that academic success was worth having in its own right or that would lead to things uh, afterwards. But you studied the Constitution yeah. and you entered a public speaking competition, very young, <laughs> much younger than the other person, yet you won. Yeah. Again, was that a slight taste of things to come? Yeah, I mean, it's this old story of one teacher, one teacher can make such a difference. Uh, and. Uh, his name, actually, his name is Martin Bell, same name as my, <laughs> my distinguished, I've always regarded Martin with a slightly uh, different light since then, when I used to know him and we were in Bosnia together, I told Martin that, and he'd, yeah, wonderful man, wonderful name, he said, I'm sure he was a fine man. Uh, but we, we Martin Bell, my, my history teacher, realized, I think, that I, well, realized I had an interest, actually, uh, in, 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 in those days, in, in the workings of the House of Commons and said, well, why don't we just study that? I don't know where it came from, but I certainly had it. So he said there was a thing that you could do called British Constitution, very dry, I don't think it would exist in this day and age. You you'd literally, it was, it was a mm. setting up, well, you were later on a distinguished chairman of one of the committees that was being set up in the 70s, the, the select committees, which didn't exist until the end of the 70s, and then right. came around and said, 79. so it was an exciting time if you're interested in British constitution. Most boys and girls would not have been. I was, for some strange reason. And that allowed me then, I did the exam, did well in it, and the school, who had been saying to me, you may not take three A-levels because you're not up to it, then relented and allowed me to take the three A-levels. So I finally did take the three A-levels. And of course, in those days, and let's be blunt about it, I did hold my knife and fork properly. Uh, and I, I eventually got a, a place at the London School of Economics with um, uh, three Bs at A-level and no maths qualification beyond O-level to do economics which in this, I've got a friend who's at, 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 at the admissions tutor at the LSE who just puts his head in his hands because for a young, you know, for a youngster now wanting to do that, it would be just impossible. You would need at least an A-star, A-level in order to be able to study economics at the LSE. So we had this sort of an enormously broad approach and obviously at Oxbridge as well, where you can go with, with no A-levels at all if, if, if people like the cut of your jib, particularly you know, someone like Oriel College Oxford was still taking in people who, would, who could play rugger well and that sort of, but you did, you know, for all the disadvantages of, of um, uh, social class suppression, which my mother would have approved of, there was also this huge advantage that you had a kind of range of people then who had gone off the rails in early life but were able to come back onto the rails in order to, 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 to take part in society, which I very much did. Justin, you've been talking about this riveting upbringing, if that's the right way to put it. Um, but, but you write quite a bit in the book about the, what was going on nationally, the 70s, mm, Britain in yeah. the 70s, near yeah. an era of, of strikes, four-day week, the IRA, and Morecambe and Wise, and, you know, and you know, it, was, it, was, it was 
I was about to say a fast-moving world, but I think that's wrong. But um, it was an interesting world. It how, was, how well, do you see it? Now? It was a world in which we belonged. And I, I do think, for all that we wouldn't want to go back to the 70s, I, I, when I was writing the book, I didn't really have a view on the 70s when I started writing, but I was thinking as I was writing, there were, we, we belonged to things that were bigger than us, whether it was the church, the political parties were still huge membership organizations, the trade unions, the football club, this kind of sense of you always being carried along in a group that was bigger than you. It was before the atomization of everything. Um, and, and I think to that extent, I think that's why my mother always got this immense strength from being part of the middle classes and how she saw uh, and actually respected and liked some working class people, provided they didn't want to change class. My mother thought that was not acceptable and not something you should be doing. But if you were happily working class, she liked you and she liked your, your, your place in that class and you could uh, belong to it without the sort of pressure personal psychological pressure that nowadays we all put on each other. So the other side of that Peter Cook joke about not having the Latin is, of course, if you were, if you failed to become a high court judge and you spoke like his character there, you could say quite legitimately, well, I do have the ability, but I could never have made it because of the class system. It wasn't me and my failings. And of course, we've moved now uh, and I've spent a lot of time in America where this was is part of the kind of national psyche. If you screw up, it's you. It's down to you as a person. And frankly, it isn't always down to you as a person. And we know that. And the class system, for all its faults, allowed people to say, look, it's the system. Uh, the system has got me. My own personal uh, uh, abilities are neither here nor there. And I do want to say, you know, the answer to your question about the 70s, I... I I don't exactly look on them fondly because there's an awful lot that was awfully wrong, but there is this sense, I think, of community in the 70s that I had forgotten until I, until I wrote the book. Hmm. And then, so there you are, you're at the LSE, um, and you decide to go into journalism and broadcasting, which hmm. is really where the book ends. <laughs> What, what prompted that decision? And this uh, is the only time I'll talk about the BBC. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, but was it a sort of... I, I genuinely never thought about my father, who, was, who had left the BBC, uh, I think, two years before I joined. But plainly, I could have contacted him. I could have talked to him about what it was like. Um, when I eventually revealed who he was, John Humphreys, who I was presenting with at the time, was properly shocked. I'm, John was very seldom lost for words, but actually <laughs> genuinely was that, that morning when I, when I told him. I, I always felt that it was something that I wanted to do from, as I say, from quite a young age. So it was an obvious place um, to go. What I didn't realize is that I'd still be doing it, goodness knows. Well, Jeremy Vernon and I started on the same day, 23rd of April, 1984. Um, we all stayed the whole way, which again would not be the thing that you'd do in any walk of, of, of life now. But we did it and we, we had this sense, I suppose, of it still being, and I think it still is today, uh, for all its faults, and it has many, and for all the questions about its future, and there are many of those as well, it, there is nowhere else in this country where you can genuinely reach a, a mass audience um, of people who are interested, whether it's on the Today programme or podcasting or whatever, or TV, which I don't much watch myself, but I understand people still do. But you, you've got this kind of huge range of outlets that actually reach people and mean things to people in their, in their lives. And I think that was the attraction then. And to be honest, it's, it's still the attraction now. Oh, uh, good. <laughs> um, For another year or so, anyway. <laughs> I think that's enough questions for me, and I, I think it's time to throw it open to the audience. I yeah. gather there's some roving microphones going to be floating around. Um, see her. Yes, the ladies. Are, right. She's any got a sash. Any questions? There we go. Any questions? Yeah. Yes, Jen, lady there. Hello. Um, your um, Americast stuff I really enjoy. Do you think Trump's going to get in? <laughs> 
I think there's a real, I, I think the American Democrats, having wanted Trump to be the candidate, prayed for him to be the candidate, thinking he's easily beaten, he's a loon. Uh, he might even destroy himself during the course of the campaign, are suddenly waking up to a new Donald Trump. And this is, I think, something we haven't properly brought across necessarily in all our reporting. Donald Trump is more disciplined now than he was last time around. Uh, and for those who don't want him to be elected, I think he's much more dangerous. He's got a team of people who know what they're doing. Um, uh, and for all that he is in desperate straits legally, I mean, properly desperate yeah. straits, he, he really does face potentially going to jail. Um, uh, for all that that is true, he is, he is uh, mounting a vigorous, organized, disciplined campaign. He's done all the right things on the Republican side to make sure that the people who might uh, replace him don't. Uh, I think he is very likely, obviously, is very likely, isn't he, to be the candidate. Um, and because of, in part, because of the weakness of Joe Biden and his um, um, obvious decline, um, not that that necessarily, you know, Ronald Reagan used to take naps, didn't he, after lunch. Not that, that necessarily affects his, jo his ability to do the job, but it affects his ability to project power and vigor. And, and to win the presidency without projecting power and vigor in a time that isn't a time of COVID is, I think, really difficult to do. So, I mean, the short answer to your question is yes, I, I think he, he could easily be elected again. Lady, lady here at the front. Following on from that, there's been an increasing trend to have politicians and other people chatting with the present as opposed to the more conventional interview of the past. Mm. How do you see the, the balance between that? And, and do you like that change? Or does it just offer different things? No, I don't think we should be friendly with politicians. I'm doing my best here, <laughs> that, I, frankly speaking. The facade. <laughs> John Humphreys, when I, when I used to present with John, he'd turn to me sometimes, there was a green room at the back of the studio, and he'd say, who's that? And it would be you know, a senior politician. John just didn't know people and didn't, wasn't particularly interested in knowing people. He was interested in asking them questions. Um, uh, and, and I think that we are, we are best serving people if we ask pointed questions and insist on them being answered. And we don't always get it right, and we certainly shouldn't be rude and abusive. And I think we did go in our interviewing in a, towards... Um, uh, when, when um, Jeremy Paxman was in his pomp and slightly afterwards, we all of us tried to be Jeremy Paxman and it was rather tiresome actually to, to listen to and to be part of. And I think we've moved back from that and I, I do think that we should have conversations and when someone is trying to answer a question, we should let them answer the damn question. But when they're trying not to answer it, we should equally... Uh, interrupt them, and it's a it's an inexact science to 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 put it mildly. But the chattiness, um, I can't stand, and it is a way. You know, it's, it's it's a real risk that politicians in the future, particularly populists, um, uh, via um, these infernal things, just go straight to people and never answer any questions at all, uh, which is bad f bad for all of us because we don't hear them um, tested. But it's also actually bad, it's just bad for them because they don't ever get the chance to think through cogently what they have to say and make the case. And I, and I think that's a, a, a damaging thing. So yeah, no chattiness I'm not keen on. No, there's a, a, a moment for it, but not with politicians, no. Any more questions? Yes, the lady here and then. The BBC is renowned for its lack of bias. What is your view on the upcoming um, news channels in inverted commas, talk TV? And oh, and GB News. news. Not yeah, they've had some difficulties recently, haven't they? Haven't they? <laughs> so, I've, so I've read. Oh, I don't know. I mean, we've got to make a decision, haven't we, really, as, as people? And it's a decision for all of us to make. Do we go down the American route or do we not? Is it inevitable that we must have opinionated broadcasting? And you can make the case, can't you? The, you can go and buy the New Statesman, you can buy The Economist, you can buy, I don't know, any, any number of, of news magazines, and you know perfectly well where it's coming from, and you still enjoy 
reading it. Uh, so why shouldn't you do that with TV channels and, and, and radio channels? And that was the approach they took in, in America since the time of Reagan, really, wasn't it? Uh, and now they've ended up with Fox and they've ended up with MSNBC on the left, um, which is, uh, frankly, as rabid as, as, as Fox. We don't talk about it as much, but, it, but it's a, a really peculiar news organization which has its own take on the world, which certainly isn't necessarily moored in reality. Um, and certainly not moored in, in impartiality. So we, we will end up going down that road if we decide to. Um, and, and it could be as well that, it is, that there's something inevitable about it because of the change in technology. It always strikes me when we do interviews on the Today program about the developing technological slash political world, and particularly this huge um, online uh, safety bill that's before Parliament at, at, at the moment, that actually the technology is in charge. Uh, the technology is, 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 is pushing us towards things that we are being pushed towards to, uh, towards in spite of our better natures, as it were. And it's happened a lot online with other platforms. But in, in 10 years' time, are we going to watch television? Will watching tele what, will, what will watching television mean? Uh, everything will be on the internet. It will be. It already is via YouTube. How do we? How do? How can we possibly? Number one, how can we say to everyone who watches television, like I'm watching television now? How can you say, well, you've got to pay a license fee to the BBC? I don't see that necessarily working. I don't think Tim Davy does either, um, the, the the Director General. In fact, I know he doesn't. And and so the technology is pushing us. It seems to me to come back to your question in a direction where there is bound to be. GB News is and all the rest of them. And the idea that you somehow put your finger in the dike and just stop it happening, keep us safe from, from that, I think is probably, frankly, um, unrealistic. Should we, though, try to stop it for another few years while we sort ourselves out? Maybe. Maybe we should. I, uh, to be honest, I'm really, I, I don't have a strong view on it because I think it's such a difficult thing because I think, I, I think organizing ourselves to do it uh, would be so difficult because of because of the tech because it's it's out there. My children don't watch television. They were really shocked. I remember you, other people will recognise as well. We came back from America and, and where they were a bit advanced in in the television watching stakes. They were nine years old. My twins when we came back from America and they, I, I said there's a program on television that I'd like you to see and they said okay let's put it on. I said no it's not on yet. It's, it's on this evening. And they just looked at me as if I was mad. <laughs> <laughs> Can't be bothered with that. Why? <laughs> so the idea of watching live broadcasting is already sort of gone. Sorry, that wasn't much of an answer, was it? But I genuinely don't know the answer, I'm afraid. Uh, yeah. The gentleman there. Step. On your um, uh, very good Americast last night, and I was listening to you this morning, uh, Naomi Klein was being interviewed, and she was talking about the great replacement theory. Mm. And I just wonder what your thoughts are on that, because I didn't know too much about it, and the more See, I look I, at it, the more It's scary. interesting. I differ with my colleagues on this a bit. I, I'm not sure. I, it worries me. And the great replacement theory is this kind of mad theory that, that well, that, that, that uh, in, in racial terms, but also in cultural terms, there is a plot afoot to bring in other cultures and other races in order that we looking like us, are, are no longer in charge. That's sort of fundamentally it, isn't it? Um, is there such a plot? No, there's no evidence of it being an organized plot. Are there changes, cultural and, and racial? Yes. I mean, particularly in the United States, by about 2050, uh, white people, actually possibly even earlier than that, white people will be a minority in the United States. Um, and uh, actually the biggest racial group will probably be Hispanic uh, uh, people. Does, does that matter? Um, not one jot. If they all sign up to being American, as previous generations of people have signed up, it matters much more, it seems to me, in the American context if they don't sign up to it. And that, I think, is where you know, I'd, I'd slightly differ with, with Naomi Klein, with others who just say it's, it's an entire conspiracy theory nonsense. I can absolutely see that culturally, if you're an American um, of, of whatever uh, color or creed, you will be very worried at the idea that modern Americans don't have the same respect for the fundamental premises of America 
as you did and as you grew up with. And I can see that that is a worry to them, and I can see why it is, because the place could quite easily fall apart. Um, so there's, there's that side to the great replacement theory, the theory itself uh, nonsensical, but the idea, this sort of uneasiness that, that a lot of Americans feel, I, I can understand, or at least I, I think is explicable. Um, though where it, it leaves the nation more widely, um, goodness only, only knows. But I don't think, well, I'm not keen on um, uh, labeling misinformation and disinformation. Mariana Spring, who I do the program with, is a dear, dear woman. I'm, I'm really fond of her. She's only 27. She's extraordinarily able, much more able than I was at that age. But I think fundamentally, I, 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 mean, I talk to her about this a lot, I, I think we lead ourselves into a difficult place when we start to say, this is misinformation and this is true, because, you know, mm. life's more complicated than that. Yeah. Who decides? Lady, lady here in the front row. Oh, so. Sorry, I'll try and give shorter answers. There's quite a few people. Hello. Um, like many people here, I'm a member of a book club. And uh, this month's book has been the gift of a radio, oh. which we only met yesterday to discuss. Wonderful. It was very well received. <laughs> um, oh, thank you. So I... the story, we leave you in your early 20s, late teens. Yes. Um, Really the interest to know how your childhood affected you into adulthood, and will there be a sequel? Yeah, it is, the, the, I'm definitely, I mean, my children would say, and my wife would say if she were here, uh, of course it's affected you. It, 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 these things, these, these experiences uh, damage you and boost you in ways that you can do nothing about, and you just have to live with the damage and the boost. And I think various aspects of my mother's love and care for me and determination that I would be okay have absolutely set me in good stead. And I mean, to be perfectly honest with you as well, I, I actually think the snobbism, I, I, in a funny kind of a way, although in so many ways it's risible and, and, and actually rather unpleasant when it, when it comes to her attitude to, to people, as I describe it in, in the book. I think when you're in pretty desperate circumstances, growing up with a sense of your own kind of superiority or, or um, impregnability is, qu is quite important. And I'm sure, actually, that I, I did have that. I always felt myself, because my mother had always told me, because I held my knife and fork properly, I'd be fine. And spoke properly, as she, as she said. I had this discussion with my colleague, Amal Rajan, who my mother would say does not speak properly. And I, <laughs> <clears throat> Amal is a bright enough and, and, and uh, uh, humorous enough person to take it in good part. In fact, he's, he's recently bought my book. I'm slightly worried about what he's, what he's going to make about it. Um, but but I, I think that side of it, um, definitely stood me in good stead in the sense that it allowed me, for all that it makes you smaller minded than you should do be, it also makes you tougher than you would uh, otherwise be. The other thing my mother gave me was a sort of sense of humor and of the ridiculous, because she was, and which I think is a really important thing, particularly as you grow older, uh, you, this sort of sense, my mother, I was really sad, I write about this in the book, I was really sad that my mother wasn't around when I, I put one of her theories to the test. She used to tell me when I was young that if you go to the Ritz, dear, uh, they will give you anything you want if you speak properly. And I was passing the Ritz, it was, it was literally a few years ago, and I'd, I was doing some corporate event and the button, the top button of my shirt had, had come off. And so I thought, well, I'll put mum to the test. And I went round that corner into the Ritz and I said, look, hello, I'm terribly sorry, but the button's come off my shirt. Would you, be, would you have anyone who could sew a button on? And they said, yes, of course, sir. It was a pleasure. <laughs> Wonderful. Thing. And they took me into a side room. There we are. Sir. No, that won't cause you any more harm. And they did the tie-up. And I said, hey. and I know as I was leaving, I was sort of getting a bit cocky. And I said to the doorman, would you, would you get me a cab, please? I'm a little bit late now. And he said, yes, of course, Mr. Vine. We'd be happy to. <laughs> and my, I did think then my mother 
You know, my mother would have really laughed at, at, at that because she would have understood the hilarity. Because Jeremy, who uh, Jeremy is a good friend of mine, I can tell you this as I've told him, him this. Jeremy is lower middle class in my mother's <laughs> mind. Okay? He grew up in what my mother would have regarded as lower middle class circumstances. And, but, but of course, it's, he was a celebrity. He'd just been on, on Strictly Come Dancing and all the rest of it. He's much better known than, than I am. So what they were recognizing at the Ritz is what you do recognize in the modern era, which is celebrity, not breeding. And my mother would have enormously enjoyed the joke of that, actually. And I think those sorts of things, that, that, that ability to change with time um, is, is something that I definitely got from her. And the ability to see the ridiculous, which is also very useful in journalism, to see the ridiculous when you're reporting on things. If you've got a sense of humor, if you can see the oddness of situations, you'll always be a better reporter than if you haven't. Time for one more question. I I see the microphone is sprinting. The, the lady there, the back. sprinting right. <laughs> yeah, lady here. We've got time for one very short. Okay, yes. very short. Sorry, sorry, that very short. This is a very short question. It's my answers that have been long. It sorry. It'll be about very that. short. As a boy in the 70s, did you have a chopper bike? <laughs> yes. Briefly, I had a chopper bike. I had all the things that you should have in the, in the 70s, but not so. Uh, not so. Um, as you would. So when I went to boarding school, my mother um, sold everything that she had given me. God knows why. Uh, and I always slightly resented it. So I had a chopper bike, but when I came home for my first holiday, it wasn't there. Nor was my train set, uh, which I still deeply resent uh, not, not being there. And a few other things also went. So yes, I did have all the things that a boy would have had in the 1970s, but they were bought either, I had an action man as well, which my mother then disapproved of, because of her Quakerism. Uh, she tried to get me action men kits that didn't have guns in them, <laughs> which if you remember action man was a decidedly difficult thing to do. So yes, I had all the accoutrements of a 70s boyhood, but with some things definitely missing. Justin, thank you. That's thank you. a wonderful Jake. portrayal of a, a generation, a family within the generation, and an individual within the family. Thank you. Well, I, I hope I meet some of you now. We're going to sign books, and um, it's all very complicated, the book signing. I don't really understand. I, uh, You've got to go to a bookshop and then go somewhere else. You have... I will be somewhere else, I think. <laughs> The signing is going to be in the cafe. That's you it. buy the book before you get to the cafe. It's the bookshop by the ballroom. But on behalf of everybody yeah, here, can, Justin, can I give you a warm vote of thank thanks? You, thank, you, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Really nice. Thank you. I enjoyed that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> can you?